Um, okay, so my name is Luca Bruno. Um, I'm gonna talk about out updates. I'm gonna do a kind of like mixed talk. Um, it's mostly technical, but there is also a bit of like history. Um, so the idea is um, in container Linux, um, as a different distribution from Fedora, um, we were used to have out updates that were automatically going to nodes. Um, after CoreOS as a company has been acquired by Raydot, we are trying to port the same model to Fedora CoreOS. Um, and we are kind of like redesigning part of it, learning a few lessons, and kind of like re-implementing things because they didn't, we couldn't manage to port them as they were from container Linux or to the Fedora CoreOS one. Um, and this is more or less the whole talk. Um, I am here, uh, this is my second vlog, uh, it's pretty nice. Um, I'm mostly a Rust and Go developer, I take care of a lot of things at the OS level itself. Um, I used to work, as I said, at CoreOS as a company. Um, I'm based in Berlin, uh, after the acquisition now I'm working at Red Hat, after the other acquisition now I'm working at IBM, uh, after the next acquisition I don't know. Um, I still plan to be based in Berlin, so if you're passing by, you find me there. Um, before doing this, I was uh, into research, mostly like security research, and after that, I was working as a security engineer. Um, and that's it. So the overview of these talks is pretty much, we're gonna split in three parts. Um, the first one is um, an overview of the container Linux model, which I guess for most of you is, mo is new, let's say. Um, and then I'm gonna pretty much like recaps uh, all the friction point that we found when using this model, when applying this model to the real world. Uh, and so we learned a few lessons and we are trying to kind of like avoid the same problems when doing the same for Fedora CoreOS. And then I'm gonna introduce like uh, what we currently have as a model for Fedora CoreOS, which is still a work in progress. We are still like de deploying and like implementing part of this, but at least we have a, r a rough idea of what we want to do. Um, so let's start from the container Linux model. Um, <clears throat> this picture is a diagram of our world um, in container Linux, and it's, the world is mostly split in three parts. There is something at the top, which is, does it work? No, okay, this is out of battery. Um, there is something at the top, which is um, our own infrastructure, so what we as a company, as CoreOS company, we were running, uh, which was mostly like the backend for the out-updates. Um, and then there is a bottom part, which is instead like, uh, what our users were running. And those users, the context of container Linux is that uh, we provide a distribution for clusters. Um, so those users were running like nodes uh, with container Linux as part of a larger cluster. Um, so we have on the bottom part this cluster which we kind of like generalize into a single machine which is the one on the right uh, and then the rest of the cluster uh, on, the, on the left side. Um, so if we focus on every single machine, every single machine is basically running at least two components out of these three. Uh, they are always running the update engine, uh, which is the top level component, which is connected to our infrastructure. And then they are running at least one of those two, one between Locksmith and Clua, uh, which is a component which uh, talks to update engine in order to orchestrate um, applying reboots. Uh, and those components, they normally have some kind of like cluster aware logic, so they defer to the rest of the cluster for actually orchestrating these kind of reboots. And I, but I'm gonna get into more details about each one in a second. Just remember that there is this split between like our architecture, uh, every single machine, and the, um, and the infrastructure for the cluster that the users are actually running. Um, so we start from the, top, from the top part, which is like the server side, our backends. Um, on that side, we have one component or two components, depending on how you look at that, um, which is core update. Um, core update is a server. Uh, it is, if I'm not wrong, it's written in Go. Um, it is an implementation of the HOMA protocol, which is a protocol for providing updates, uh, and it's based on XML. Um, from our side, we use this as a normal web application with a JavaScript interface, and we also have some command line interface for the same API. Uh, the key point is that this is proprietary code, so this is something that as a company we were actively like um, sold, uh, selling to customers as a service, um, except for like the large, um, the large majority of users that were using our free offering, in which case they were just like consuming this but without access to the uh, web interface or to the, prod to the product itself. Um, there are third-party implementation of this, which is why I have like two names at the top. Um, 
and an interesting part of this is that it's a traditional application. So it has like a backend, uh, a front end, and some database, uh, which is Postgres, if I'm not wrong. Um, and it is like stateful at every single level. Um, and it's not even like a distributed state, it's actually like linked to a specific database instance. Um, and as I said, like this is the server side for the out updates, but at the same time, uh, by the way that the Yoma protocol works, uh, we can also like track um, client statistic and usage metric um, so that we can actually serve different updates to different clients. Um, this is both good and bad. Um, the problem is that this kind of architecture has several issues when you start distributing the setups, especially like in the database. Um, and in general, like this client, tracking client statistic is very stressful on the database. Um, and this is fine in most cases, let's say you can just like scale your resources as you, as you prefer, uh, but at the same time like this is a key component of the out update infrastructure, so uh, the more pains and the more stress we can get out of this path, the better it is. And then we proceed, like the counterpart of this on the client side, so on every single machine, on every single node, uh, is the update engine, which is a client uh, unexpectedly for the same protocol that the update engine uh, provides. So uh, it's, a, it's still like an XML based OMA protocol. Um, this company is pretty much a kitchen sink. Like it takes care of everything from uh, periodically polling for new updates information, downloading these new updates information, uh, applying them to the system, which in our case means we have an AB scheme for the user partition, so we always have like an active partition with the active slash user and a passive partition with the passive slash user. And this company is, is in charge of like writing to one, activating it, um, rebooting into the proper one, or going back to the other one if something went wrong. Um, this is kind of like a huge, I mean, not, not the largest software that I've seen, but like it's kind of like a big project. Uh, it's written in C++. Originally, it was written by Google. Um, there are multiple forks of this, like in the public, but also like internally at Google. Uh, our own, it's just like it's under our GitHub organization, and it's just like our own maintained fork uh, at some point in the past. But it's notably used by all the Chrome OS, for example. Um, for all the Chromebooks, sorry. Um, so the key point is that this is like an high complexity piece of software, it's written in C++. Um, it owns every single aspect of the out update story and from our point of view it's kind of like we don't have, unfortunately as a startup, we don't have like enough, enough uh, workforce to properly maintain this one. So we are mostly like using it as we initially forked it but we touch it very, very ra rarely so it's effectively like pretty much unmaintained software from the point of view that it works and we don't touch it. Then there is the last piece of this story, which is um, whenever we provide an update to some machine, this machine is gonna try to apply this update and then reboot in order to actually activate this, this out update. Uh, this is because we follow like an atomic system where an update updates the whole OS as a whole without like single packages updates. So in order to actually use this new update, you need to reboot into that. Um, there is a problem with this model, which is if we start pushing updates to all the nodes and you have like 20 nodes for high availability of your cluster and all of them are applying the same update at the same time and rebooting, your availability just immediately disappear because then you have a downtime of the whole cluster. Uh, so something that sits on the side of this update engine is another company which takes care of reboot coordination and it's basically like something which is in charge of deciding which node can be down rebooting at, at what time. Um, so initially we wrote something called Locksmith, which is a Go binary that is part of the operating system itself. Uh, it provides a few strategy for rebooting, like reboot immediately or reboot within uh, a window, of a maintenance windows, or reboot whenever you get some semaphore locked in a distributed database, for example, on HC2. Uh, and that was our initial implementation. Um, then as the, move, as the world moved forward into the Kubernetes world, somebody came up with like a different requirement, which is on Kubernetes, I already have a distributed database and an API for like putting and retrieving objects in there, which is the Kubernetes API. But I don't have access to the HCD cluster itself because it's normally part of the internal implementation of Kubernetes. Um, so we wrote another component which is similar but different, which is a containerized version of the same logic, which is called the Container Linux Operator or CLUO. Um, so we basically 
push this logic out of the operating system into a container. This container is scheduled itself by Kubernetes, uh, and the logic is that it, now this kind of like fleet-wide reboot coordination is done via Kubernetes object. So we are pushing object to Kubernetes in order to know which node is allowed to reboot and when to reboot. Um, and we are retrieving these nodes in order to get the information about the, the state of the reboot across the, the cluster. Um, and this is, this is actually, this architecture actually requires two components at this point. One which is the update operator itself, so the manager, and something that is in charge of like rebooting every single node, so something like an agent on each node. And that one is another container which is deployed as a daemon set on every machine. Um, so the key point in this slide is that those two components, they basically implement a very, very similar logic, but they share pretty much no code between them because they run in completely different contexts and they also take completely different kind of like API and logic and stuff. So there is a lot of overlaps, but not all, a lot of like compatibility and logic sharing. Um, and that's showing back like the picture. That's just what we saw so far. And now we're gonna progress. It's like, that was the point when Red Hat acquired CoreOS and it was working pretty well, except for a few friction points. Those friction points were a bit like everywhere in this picture. Like, uh, the first one was the server side. The server side was proprietary software. It didn't honestly get a lot of like revenues from that, but it was still like something that we were selling. The problem is that people also want to use it without paying royalties to us, which is fine. Um, so they had to re-implement basically exactly the same stuff as open source, which is a failure if you, are, if you care about like free software. Um, Another like goal, so these are kind of like goals that are derived from those friction points. Another goal was like um, this service was taking care of tracking stuff as well uh, on top of like serving updates and that was, and that part was actually causing, causing us more friction so we can actually try to decouple those two problems and say okay if the out updates were working well and the problem were on the tracking part, let's move the tracking somewhere else. Um, that way, another idea that we had is kind of like we try to avoid exploiting an explosion in the cardinality in the database because we are not tracking stuff anymore actively. We can try to make it like as much stateless as possible. So getting rid of all the statefulness where possible. Um, and then most of this was, most of this model was fitting well for a company that was doing stuff like internally. So people outside of the company were just consuming other days. They were not in charge of like looking how we were making release except for like they know that this content goes inside this release but when we are actually tagging a release or how we are rolling out to the, to the, to the, to the cluster, that's not our, their concern. Uh, so there was a lot of like private and hidden state which was, as, let's say slightly a problem for the, for, the, for the general audience, but also a problem for us because then we started like selling instances of these that were like in other environments, like in our gapped environment. And so there was always like some kind of manual coordination point for syncing all the database and syncing all the customers and kind of like providing these kind of uh, like bundles, uh, which was, it was working if you are a company, but if you are a community, it's not something that you are really looking forward for. Um, Next step is like in the client side. In the client side, it was working pretty well. We didn't have major problem. Uh, the major problem was, sorry, the, the only problem was kind of like maintaining this beast. Like it's something that we got from, from Google. It was working pretty well, but we definitely don't have like the, uh, the developer team uh, that Google have dedicated to this. Uh, so we ended up with kind of like something very complex written in C++ that is not one of our main languages and uh, effectively like not getting any kind of development or stuff, which is good and bad depending on which stage you are of this journey through out updates. Um, one actual architectural problem is that everything was coupled into this update engine. Like it was doing discovery, it was doing the deployments, it was doing rollbacks and everything else. Um, and it was also like mostly interactive. Like it offered a DBus API. Um, that's how you do everything and it's kind of like, you cannot configure this stuff initially um, on first boot in a declarative way. Um, it, this, was, this was built before systemd, so even the configuration itself was not like taking care of like overlays and snippet and sorry, and drop-ins and things like that. So it's kind of like, it's a traditional old style Linux, de Linux daemon. Um, and it's not particularly easy for administrator to monitor, which means that if something goes back with the out updates and there is a rollback and stuff like that, 
Um, you are kind of like supposed to manually look into every single node interactively or build your own tool to, man to monitor this stuff. So these are all like goals, friction that we saw, goals that we are trying to kind of like achieve when redoing this stuff. And the last step is the reboot coordination. Um, the problem here is that just in our small world, we already ended up with like two implementation of these that were running in different scenarios. Um, and the problem, and the reason why we ended up there is that we initially built one implementation with the assumption that it was fitting in every single use case. And then we had to actually move most of this logic somewhere else because it was not fitting another use case that we had. Um, so this time we are kind of like trying to future-proof the design a bit more. Uh, so moving most of this logic out of the host itself so that the customer, if it's running, sorry, the, the consumer, if it's running Kubernetes or any other cluster orchestration, they can actually decide which backend to use. Uh, we are trying to future-proof a bit the design, uh, decoupling it from a specific database because before it was only etcd or only Kubernetes and some specific version of Kubernetes. And we are, at, by doing this, we hope to allow other people to implement like their own backend logic. So if you want to implement like a Nomad backend or a Postgre backend, you can do whatever you want. Um, okay, and the last step is not really technical, it's more like the human process. The human process behind this uh, was, again, like designed for a company, uh, which means that you basically trust every single component. Um, you don't need to have like 100% audit or review of what's going on because you know the few people that have access to stuff and you always can reconstruct what was going on via logs, chats, email, and everything else, uh, which is not normally true for a distributed open source team. Um, there were a lot of manual operation and manual coordination via chat, like now I'm doing this, now I'm doing that, now please review this, now please give me access to that, and so on and so far. Um, and there was not a central public source of truth, so the, the central source of truth was this internal communication channel. Um, so we are also trying to kind of like improve the process in that regard by kind of like having something which can be like reviewed, audited, and observed from the outside. and being able to point people to what is the central public source of truth so that they can actually reproduce the whole flow. So the new model more or less looks like this. Um, it's still split in these th three areas, like some infrastructure from our side, at this point is the Fedora infrastructure, uh, a local cluster that the user is running, and then the local cluster has one specific machine that we are looking at, and then the rest of the cluster. Um, so the key ideas, the, the main points in these slides is that we are actually trying to split the logic a bit more and moving some of these components. So as you can see, like now there are two components on the top, one which is like um, providing the out update ints and the other one which is providing like the update payload. Uh, then there are two components at the bottom as well, one which is consuming the out update ints and the other one which is actually downloading and applying those updates. And then there is another component which we kind of like pushed to the left side, it was not there before, it didn't exist, um, which is something that you run on the cluster for doing this reboot coordination. So what before was on the host, or at least there was some kind of like split between host and cluster components, now it's pushed to the cluster. And so now it says airlock and that's CD3 or other because it's like, it doesn't really matter what you're running on the rest of the cluster from the point of view of the node. So let's start from the last point that we were touching, um, how to do the release process itself. Um, we overall this a bit, quite a bit actually, and we basically ended up with what is our normal development process, process which is you have a repository somewhere, you open a pull request, somebody reviews it, you get merged, and then some other action is triggered after that. And in the middle you run CI or whatever you want to run. So that is exactly what we do by having a repository in GitHub that contains definitions about like what are the current updates being rolled out to the cluster. Um, we basically implemented all the process that we had internally rebuilt for this scenario so we can do stuff that we were doing before which basically means we can push multiple rollouts in parallel. Uh, rollouts means that we are pushing an updates uh, gently, let's say over a period of time to all the nodes that exist in the world. We can pause some update, that it, some rollout that is going on. We can resume these updates if we think that it's, it could be resumed. Uh, we can have update barriers, which means uh, we want all the nodes to pass through some specific updates. Uh, we can signal when there are dead ends because we are human, we make bugs. Uh, from time to time we make releases that cannot proceed further via out updates. And so we need to signal this somehow to the client. 
Um, this process is automatable, which means that we have an initial step, which is manual, like opening this pull request and pushing uh, the definition. Uh, and then everything else can be kind of like uh, automated in the public, could be audited by anybody looking at that, and there is no sprawling of like multiple private database. There is actually no more database involved into this. It's less eye-catching than core updates, no web UI, no whatever. Uh, it could be added, but it's definitely more developer, uh, DevOps friendly. Um, then the, the other component at the top is Cincinnati. Cincinnati is the back end. Um, it's more or less what we had before with core update, except that now it only does one thing, which is update hinting. Uh, which means the clients are periodically polling this server, and the server is returning back a JSON object, which is a DAG, a direct acyclic graph of the available updates. Uh, and this is just basically hinting clients, telling them, hey, if you want, there are these updates available. Um, this company is completely stateless, as I say, like the, in the process there is no states. Um, it's written in Rust, it's deployed in the Fedora infrastructure, and we don't actually record anymore any usage metrics. We just have like some metrics from the application to see if it's going well, and that's it. So by doing this, we reduce the scope, we reduce the protocol, we formalize what is the graph model for the other dates, and that's the world where, that we are kind of like following. Um, then the component on the, on the side of this one is still like on the node itself. It's RPM OS3, which is used by other Fedora flavors as well. Um, it does atomic OS management, so it's kind of like Git, but for the root file system. It's based on OS3, which means that you have kind of like uh, saving this consumption uh, by not having like duplicate copies of the same binary content. It allows out updates, atomic updates, and atomic rollbacks, um, an, an arbitrary number of deployments, and you can also install like RPMs. It's written in C. Um, part of these are ported to Rust. It's still in progress. And it basically bridges between two worlds, the RPM, the traditional RPM world, and the immutable OS world. Um, on the client side, there is also um, something that polls Cincinnati, which is the Zincati client. Um, it's another component. Like This time, it's fully declarative. It's written in Rust. Um, it checks for out updates and is in charge of like triggering reboots. Um, it is a bit less complex than the update engine. It's, it's a single state machine with less than 10 states. Um, it mediates between these other components like Cincinnati, RPM S3, and Rlock that we're gonna see soon. And it actually exposes metrics in the Prometheus format so that you can monitor the whole cluster, the whole fleet of nodes from a single point of view. Um, this is the component that we started writing from scratch, but in practice it's pretty much like we took the logic from Locksmith and we kind of like reorganized it, reshuffled it a bit, and wrote it in a component that works with RPM OS3. Um, and the last piece is Airlock, which is this logic that we pushed out of the node. So it does reboot coordination. It's actually like kind of like a server for, Zin for Zincati to ask for a permission for rebooting. Um, but it's not anymore on the host itself. It's in a container somewhere. Um, so you, you basically do count accounting semaphore with recursive locking uh, over HTTPS and nothing more. Um, we have an implementation of this, which is this airlock, um, which uses HCD3 as a backend. Uh, and we standardize the protocol between Zincati and airlock, which means that we provide this, but if you want to provide your own Kubernetes-based implementation or Postgres-based implementation and you are the expert in, this, in your domain, you are free to maintain this as your own container and deploy it as a container. Uh, and that's the recap of what we just went through. So it's like, that's the split. The server side, the client side, uh, a client side which is checking for update scenes, a server side which is providing update scenes, uh, a server side which is, pro pro which is providing OS3 updates, a client side which is downloading and apply, applying these OS3 updates, and then something in the cluster which takes care of like reboot management across the whole fleet. And that was all. So we started a bit late, we finished a bit late. I can take, I guess, a couple of questions maximum. Um, and these are the references for what I just talked about. And you have a question from yesterday, so. Yeah, uh, well, I just wanted to, uh, this most probably answer my question, I just want to really confirm. Uh, let's say I'm, I have a small cluster I want to set up, um, and I am not running uh, OpenShift or KD on it. Um, how easy is it to get um, cluster aware updates, like uh, reboots on, on that? Is it going to, am I going to have to really build that myself, or is that going to basically work out of the box? Yeah, so this, this, that's the basic picture, and in this picture there is no Kubernetes or OpenShift involved at all. And the idea is the, we provide the initial implementation exactly because we want one-to-one 
parity, future parity between what we had in container Linux and what we have now in Fedora Core S, which means the model that works without Kubernetes or OpenShift in the middle. So you just need basically somewhere to deploy this airlock, which could be in the cluster itself, but it gets tricky at some point, um, and a database, which is an etc da database. But again, if you want to implement this stuff like in Perl and using a MySQL database and you can talk to this somehow, then it's like there is no Kubernetes involved in, in any of these. Please. Um, so I think that like my personal answer is no because these are just like providing updates and your question is more about like when are you building a release? Do you actually send out messages? And the answer is like no, but we plan to if I'm not wrong. But again, this is just like about okay, updates yeah, so and not releases. Like, I think both when you can actually build a release but also like when an update is available, there's a lot of things that would be really useful. Okay, so you would like to get basically a fed message whenever we yeah, do this kind of manipulation. That wasn't a question, it, cheating. Um, my, my <laughs> I'm from Italy, I, I, I live in Germany. Somebody in the US decides to name <laughs> stuff according like to American cities and I'm fine with that. As long as I can pronounce them, so it's like, since you know it's kind of like okay to pronounce, so it's fine, there are, <laughs> there are weirder ones. I don't have an answer for that, like again, like. Um, so the protocol, um, what is the protocol? The protocol is here. So we didn't come up with this protocol, I mean, not me personally. Um, this is something that we share with the OpenShift organization, sorry, with the OpenShift product, let's say. Uh, as you can see, like the implementation, it's under the OpenShift um, org on GitHub, uh, which means that we are basically just like piggybacking on some design that they did for the out updates for OpenShift, and we are basically providing another implementation and logic for the same protocol, both server side and client side. Other questions? No? One? Two? Question. So would you say that overall the work is much better now uh, than the previous model that you had? I would say that I submitted this presentation before actually implementing like half of this. Um, we actually tested it exactly once, which was this Monday, and it worked pretty well. It didn't, it didn't show any kind of like major bugs, and it works exactly as we were trying to do on the first try, which is kind of like from my point of view, it's amazing, but <laughs> I, I could not say that like this model that we are still implementing works better than the other one that we proved for kind of like four years or a bit more. So it's like, that's a bit of a bold statement I'm not making. <laughs> but it should according to what we are kind of like thinking and designing, but it could have bugs anywhere and we could have kind of like missed stuff. So it's, uh, I don't know. It's an experiment at the end of the day, like we are, we are trying it. Okay. I think I'm going to close here and, and leave the, the stage. Thank you very much.